Welcome. Welcome to Seafair and the Fleet Week at Seattle Rotary. The Rotary Club of Seattle is the fourth oldest and one of the world's largest Rotary Clubs, where we embrace service above self and are connecting for good. Today, we'll celebrate summer with special guests, including Seafair royalty and distinguished representatives from the US and Canadian Sea Services. And at the conclusion of today's meeting, I'd like to invite you to just step out on the balcony and join us for a Coast Guard search and rescue demo. So that'll be the capstone of our meeting. But to begin our program, I'm delighted to welcome Commander Michael Greenwald. He's the chaplain of the US Coast Guard District 13. He'll offer our inspiration for the day. And then please remain standing because the singing of the US and Canadian anthems will be performed by musician first class, Mallory McKendry. Commander Greenwald. I don't think I need the box. <laughs> well, this is awesome. As we're gathered here this afternoon, um, I invite you to join with me. To join with me in prayer and thought in accordance with and in keeping with your personal disciplines and your personal traditions. So now let us pray. Merciful God, source of the light which illuminates our way, source of the richness across the landscape of creation which nourishes our bodies, kindles our imaginations, and stirs our souls, source of the inner hunger which moves us to live with integrity, to serve with honor, to care with compassion. We ask your blessing upon all gathered here today. Bless the time we share and the meal which is served. As individuals and communities committed to serving, we pray your spirit to stir an ever-strengthening wind of expression, of assistance, and of sacrifice in and through our lives that what is right and just in your heart is made real in our lives. In your name, which is above all others, we now pray. Amen. Thank you. Oh, Canada, our home and native land, true patriot love in all thy sons command. With glowing hearts we see thee rise, the true north strong and free. From far and wide, O oh Canada, we stand on guard for thee. God, keep our land glorious and free. O oh Canada, we stand on guard for thee. O oh Canada, we stand on guard for Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we hailed at the twilight's last gleaming, whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rocket's red glare the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag was still there 
Oh, say does that star-spangled banner wave o'er the land of the free and the home of the As we learned in a feature program two months ago, Beth is now president and CEO for the Special Olympics US Games that are being held in Seattle in July of 2018. However, when I play the word association game and I think of Beth, I still associate her with Seafair. However, this is actually Beth's first summer in 10 years when she is not producing our region's marquee summer event. So instead, Beth has been sighted enjoying herself around town. I understand time has been spent at the Chateau Saint Michel Winery, Teatro Zinzani, uh, hiking at Crystal Mountain, and enjoying all the things that we always take for granted in terms of enjoying our Northwest summer. Last month, Beth marked her fifth year as a Seattle Rotarian, and I'm very grateful to her because she did step up to lead our Seattle Seafair Rotary Program team. And I'm going to turn it over to you today. It's, got a great, it's a great program, and thank you, Beth, for all you do. Thank you, Kathy. Uh, yeah, it's a strange and wonderful thing to have uh, the ability to say, yeah, I'll go to that show tomorrow night. Uh, but I, I do uh, also have a lot of uh, nostalgia for the, the role of that, that Seafair plays in this community. And so with that, it is truly my honor to introduce uh, the members for our show, short program today. And I'd like to first call to the stage the 2016 Queen Elcyon for Seafair, Shelley Hart. A Seattle native, Shelley is a longtime leading midday radio air personality and is also known for her work as the Encore Entertainment MC for the Seattle Storm. <laughs> Got some fans. She is also a, uh, as active in the community as she is on air, hosting charity events, galas, and auctions. More recently, Shelley produced Chad's Legacy. Ending the Stigma of Mental Illness, a short documentary for the Chad's Legacy Project, which will be released this fall. Shelley, we're glad to have you here. And to lead our short program is uh, someone I'm very proud to introduce, uh, my successor as president and CEO of Seafair, Richard Anderson. Richard, will you join us up here as well? <laughs> Richard's background uh, includes CEO of one of the world's largest multi-venue sport and entertainment organizations in Edmonton, Canada. He has also operated Lighthouse Management and Training and previously served as General Manager of the San Diego Padres, Petco Park, and held similar roles uh, for the Florida Marlins, Pittsburgh Pirates, and Atlanta Braves. I'm proud to call Richard my friend and thrilled that Seattle's favorite festival is in such capable hands. Welcome to Seattle for Rotary, Richard. Thanks, Beth, and uh, thanks so much for having us. Uh, what a great opportunity. I, I want to start right out by saying the only thing I, I missed was, was being, a, being the next Beth. Uh, you know, if you think about uh, the last, I guess, 15 years or so, we had Beth Wojcik, and then we had Beth Knox, and uh, so I'm, I'm working on a name change. I don't know that I can reach the level that they've reached, but I am working on a name change and very blessed to, uh, to have such uh, incredible people in front of me. You know, basically my role as CEO, and, and both Beths would share this with you, is to be a steward of something that's been in this community for 67 years. 67 years ago, roughly this time, the leadership that lived in Seattle wanted to get the community together in some sort of way that they hadn't before. So they put on the first torchlight parade, and my research in coming to the area, because I was obviously very interested in learning what I could, was I found out the population was about 300,000 people at that time and 250,000 people came downtown to see that first parade. Pretty amazing. So I want you to think about that for a second. Because in this day, with all that's going on in the world, 
Every time you see anything in the media, you pick up a paper, you listen to the radio, unless it's Shelley's show, uh, you, you watch TV, you turn on your laptop, typically there's news that's pretty challenging to pay attention to. And yet every one of us, our hearts desire joy. Our, des our hearts want to create memories. Our hearts want to be with family and loved ones and do things that make a difference. We really are built and put on this planet to help other people. And so when this opportunity came along to, to be a part of Seafair, I could see why both Beths wanted to do it and why all of our wonderful board members, many of members of this club, I'd introduce them, but I'd lose my 14 minutes here, um, wanted to be a part of this. And it's because we get a chance in some small way to make a difference. Seattle is an incredible community. I've traveled around, as you heard from, from past, I've traveled around, I don't know of a Seafair in another community, another organization that that basically does what the public sector can't do and the private sector doesn't want to do and jumps in and fills the gap and does all the things that the leadership of this organization has done for so long. If you don't remember anything else I say, it's about three things that this organization exists. And, and this is everything we do. We're about building community. Everything Seafair does is about bringing this community together. We do 32 civic community focused events that we sanction and help support 75 events in basically a 10-week period of time overall, but the little events that draw 50 people or the larger ones that draw tens and hundreds of thousands are all just incredibly important. They're building community. The second is we're in the memory-making business. Everything Seafair does is about making lifetime memories. I was interviewing someone for a job several months ago, and I've shared this with a couple of other people. I, I asked him as, at the end of the interview, so do you know anything about Seafair? And he said, yeah, you know, I actually grew up with it. And he said, when I was a little boy, my dad used to take me down. And my whole family, we would watch uh, the Blue Angels. And it was the amazing. And the hydroplanes. And my dad would put me up on his shoulder. And my mom would put cotton in my ears. And he said, I remember three or four years in a row doing that. And it just, I've, I've never forgotten. And I said, well, what, what was most special about it? He said, well, everything that was going on was great. But it was the fact that there was this opportunity to have that special private time with my dad. And so that's what Seafair is really about. It's about building memories. And then finally, it's affordable fun. Everything we do, you can come to for free, including Seafair Weekend. You can come Friday. It's a free day for free. So everyone in this community, regardless of their economic condition, they can go to the Torchlight Parade. They can come see the Seafair Summer 4th. Uh, they can come to Seafair Weekend. And all of that's because of great community leadership, our board, on the backs of 1,500 plus volunteers for this weekend and close to 3,000 total, Seafair is summer, but Seafair is about making a difference in the community, and we're very, very grateful as an organization this year to have an opportunity to, again, put on the 67th edition. Hope you'll come out. Some amazing new things going on this weekend. Uh, the air show, the Blue Angels are back, of course, and uh, breathtaking, and I, had, I actually did call Beth uh, when I was driving to the airport the other day to meet them, and I said, you know, I'm just driving out here and I almost teared up thinking about you. This is the first time in 10 years you haven't been the one going out here. How you doing? She goes, I, I got to admit, uh, you know, I feel a little melancholy. I miss this. I thought I would, too. It's, it's an amazing opportunity, everything that, that uh, we get to do. But the blues are back. The hydroplanes are back. Several levels of them, the F1s, the H1s. We're introducing Bolt on the Blue, which is speed skiing. If you haven't seen it, just come out. 100 mile an hour plus, water skiers on a two. I know. It's safe. <laughs> They're on ropes 200 feet behind the boat. And they're racing 10 at a time. And the world championships will be here next year. 80 countries represented. It's a huge deal for us. And we'll do it Seafair weekend next year with the world championships. So please come out. We're doing lots to, to make this easier for you to get to and to build on the backs of all that's gone before us. And now I want to shift focus a little bit. And, and let's really talk about the core of Seafair and what we really do. And it's my great pleasure to, to reintroduce Shelley Hart. Uh, I got introduced to this whole concept of Queen Alcione, uh, this being my first time, and I was going, okay, so sort of explain this. She is a difference maker. You know her as a radio personality and a civic leader. I know her as somebody that really cares about people. So we're going to ask her a few questions here. Awesome. Bring it. And the, an and the answers are not A or B or <laughs> D. or. So I guess first, since you've been with Seafair now for a while and you have a history, Shelley. Yeah. What's, um, what, what's your greatest memory so far? Well, you know, I, I have a lot of great memories having been born and raised here in Seattle and now into my 30th year of uh, radio here in my very own hometown, which rarely even happens. 
Uh, I've been involved with Seafair off and on throughout the years, well, actually probably every single year. One of my uh, fondest memories I can remember in radio, so we used to do uh, pirate radio for a radio station that I worked for, and we would convince somebody to, hey, loan us your yacht, this will be great, we'll broadcast live for a week, Lake Washington, and I think probably those times we got in more trouble with Seafair, uh, cruising around Lake Washington, but man, what great memories. Uh, but one of my, my fondest would have to be about 20 years ago uh, at this time, and um, my nephew, who I lived across the street from, just over here in West Seattle, this is when I started to introduce him to Seafair and all its fun, and we'd watch the fleet come in from the viewpoints over in West Seattle, and uh, we would sit on my, my back deck and say, hey, come on over, let's have a popsicle. Auntie has something for you. So we'd sit on the back deck, and he's just barely two years old. I'd open up all the windows, and we'd usually start around Monday. I'd get them all fired up about the Blue Angels are coming, the Blue Angels. So we'd sit there, and we'd have that popsicle, and all the windows are open. And I'd sit there, and I'd go, all right, you got to say it. Blue Angels, where are you? And he'd look at me for a second. I'm like, come on, you can do it, buddy. Eventually he would, and it would be, Boo Angels, where are you? Well, we'd do this every day, come about Thursday when the official practice would happen. That one time when he did it, Boo Angel, where are you? Then you would hear the roar in the sky over West Seattle, and this kid lit up like I'd never seen before. And I remember it must have been about three weeks after the fact, because this became a signature thing for us for many years. But that first year, for three weeks, uh, three weeks after the fact, I'm at the grocery store at Safeway in West Seattle, and I'm just doing my whatever shopping, and I hear a handful of aisles over, so faintly, Blue Angels, where are you? And I'm like, what? And I, I walk down about three or four aisles, and there he is with his parents holding his big giant stuff, Pikachu, and his rubber boots and his goofy hat, just sitting in the grocery cart as his parents are shopping. Boo Angels, where are you? In the middle of Safeway. So it does create such wonderful memories. Awesome. And that, if that doesn't under, everybody here has a memory we've heard about bicycles and hydroplane, wooden hydroplane being pulled behind and so many, many great memories. You know, at the end of the day, we all do what we do because there's something that tugs at us. Yeah. Uh, tell us a little, if you would, what really pulled you into wanting to be Queen Alcyone and, and you've been amazing at it. Well, you know, with Seafair and working with um, with you all for so many years, there's there's the volunteer aspect. And when you really put together how many people volunteer to make Seafair happen and all of the community events that around the Puget Sound and there are so many you know I get people who ask me all the time hey I want to volunteer I want to do something you know what consider Seafair if not for one of their signature events go to the website see what else are involved in you know give back to the community I think it's always been important to be a personality with purpose and to give back to the community that you love Beautiful. And, and in terms of any specific stories what's the funniest thing that's happened to you so far well uh, probably Besides meeting me. <laughs> it would have to be probably that day walking through with Chad, uh, you know, in, in the grocery store. So um, I think I already kind of covered that story. But there's, there, there's just so many things that happen. And again, just memory after memory after memory. So it, maybe last question, uh, Shelley, in terms of, of things that deeply matter to you, you've got some, some special focuses from a, a give back perspective. Yeah. Share what you'd be willing to share with us. Um, you know, it's interesting, the universe and all about timing. So that little boy, that my nephew, his name is, is Chad. And um, in January of this year, at the age of 21, he lost his battle with mental illness, uh, a disease that came on hard and fast and manifested itself uh, while he was in college. Um, so in our grief with his parents, that little boy that I turned on to, to the Blue Angels who grew up, who was going to fly him and just got too darn tall. I think he got to be about 6'8". He went to aviation high. I mean, he was going to fly planes, and then he was going to work for NASA. He was just incredibly brilliant. Uh, but losing someone in a situation like that, you know, it, it is, is so challenging. And his, his parents are such wonderful people, and his mother is... Uh, you know, in, in a high position at Children's Hospital here at Seattle Children's. And, you know, we looked at each other and said, enough is enough with this mental illness in that we created the Chad Legacy Project. All of the footage that we did, all the Seafair times that we did video and whatnot, I sat down with his mom and dad, and they told 
the most incredible story. And I grabbed a lot of that old school B-roll from the Blue Angels to the fleet coming in, and we created a 17-minute a uh, short documentary that is going to uh, live on the internet for free and social media platforms of these two very normal people where this incredible disease happened and the very hopes, and we are in film festival submission phase right now to five across the country. Our hope is when we release this late fall, early winter, is that we just get people talking. It's just time to end the stigma. It's time to research. It is time to uh, find these people resources. And at the very least, we're working on a curriculum to be introduced in high schools for early education. Yeah. Shelly, thank you very much. Thank Let's you. Thank you. Thank you. You know, the difference between success and significance, and if that doesn't embode it, uh, nothing does. Thank you for all you're doing. Thank, Thank you, you for having us here. Sea Fair is summer. We'll see you this weekend. Thank you. Thank you, Richard, and uh, thank you, Queen Shelley, for sharing memories and uh, special Sea Fair moments. Well, together with Tom Jaffa and Beth Knox, our young Rotary leader, Ian Hudson, has been integral to the planning of today's program. Ian, will you come up and join me for a minute? Well, more than a minute. Ian is a vice president at Bernstein Global Wealth, and he's been a member of our club since April of 2014. And he just returned from a three-week tour in Bahrain where he was a pilot with the Naval Reserves. So welcome back. And you're actually gonna learn a little bit more about that in a couple of weeks. But today, Ian is gonna be facilitating a panel of experts, a guest panel, and they're gonna be addressing a very timely topic, the intersection of technology and the military. So I'm turning it over to you, Ian, and thank you for your help with today's program. always wanted to do that. Well, you know, back at my uh, Naval Academy days, seeing this much brass would always make me nervous. Um, but I guess it's a good thing. Growing up here in the Northwest, Seafair was always my favorite time of year. Um, you know, we're all very, very lucky to be in this part of the region because nowhere else in the country do we have such a mix of our aviation and maritime industries both military and civilian, but also such a bastion of technology and innovation. And what better, more appropriate topic today for our Seafair program than to talk about technological innovation within the military. And we have some of our best and brightest joining us here today. So I'll just introduce them briefly. Joined by Lieutenant Holly Bergman. Holly, Lieutenant Bergman's a native of Los Angeles and completed high school in Woodbridge, Virginia and is a 2010 graduate of the U.S. Coast Guard Academy, where she earned a Bachelor of Science degree in government. Her initial assignment in the Coast Guard was deck watch officer on board the Coast Guard's largest vessel and icebreaker, the Coast Guard Cutter Healy. She served as communications, command, security, and training officer. She completed seven Arctic research expeditions and one humanitarian mission escorting a tank vessel through over 400 miles of winter ice in the Bering Sea to aid in the isolated town of Nome, Alaska during a severe fuel shortage. Lieutenant Bergman's next, next assignment was deputy of the enforcement division and patrol boat manager of four Coast Guard cutters at Sector Honolulu. During her tenor, tenure, she conducted search and rescue, pollution response, presidential protective detail, and oversaw maritime fisheries, ports, waterways, and coastal security enforcement operations throughout the main Hawaiian Islands. She currently serves as the environmental specialist for the 13th Coast Guard District Incident Management and Pollution Response Advisory Team. The district's area of responsibility stretches from the Pacific Northwest and the southwestern Canadian border, encompassing the state of Washington, Oregon, Montana, and Idaho. Her awards include the Coast Guard Commendation Medal, the Coast Guard Arctic Service Medal, and several meritorious unit awards. Also joining us is Lieutenant Caitlin Park, Parks, a native of Avoca, New York. She's a 2011 graduate of Ohio State University where she earned a Bachelor of Arts degree in Security and Intelligence and was commissioned as an ensign. She made two deployments in the Fifth Fleet in and around the Persian Gulf, 
Joint Warrior 2012, Fort Lauderdale Week 2012, and exercised Bold Alligator in 2012. She was initially the communications officer on the USS Gettysburg, CG-46, and she served as the assistant to the training and readiness officer and staff navigator in the commander of D Destroyer Squadron 9, making two deployments on RIMPAC 2014 and Pacific Partnership 2015. Her most recent assignment is a sexual assault prevention and response officer at Navy Region Northwest, encompassing 11 Northwest states, four naval in, uh, installations, and she's also studying to get her master's degree in emergency management and homeland security from Arizona State University. Her decorations include the Navy Commendation Medal and the Navy Achievement Medal and various unit awards. And last but not least, our civilian contingent from Boeing is Matt Carrion. Matt serves as the global sales and marketing lead for the Boeing P-8 program. In this capacity, is responsible for all facets and business strategy uh, and business generation for the P-8 market in the United Kingdom, Norway, and emerging countries. Prior to civilian world, Matt served as nine years in the Navy. He was initially qualified as an evaluator and mission commander in the EP-3 while being assigned to the Fleet Patrol Reconna Reconnaissance Squadron 2 in Rota, Spain, and he later transitioned to Special Projects Patrol Squadron 2 in Kenioe Bay, Hawaii, where he was qualified as a sensor coordinator and mission commander. His awards include the Navy Expeditionary Medal, the Iraq Campaign Medal, the Afghanistan Campaign Medal, seven Air Medals, Joint Service Commendation Medal, the Navy Commendation Medal, the Navy Achievement Medal, and a letter of accommodation from General McChrystal, Commander, Joint Special Operations Command. So as you can see, we have a very talented and robust group with us today. And thank you. And what I thought would be appropriate is asking each one of you just to share what the biggest innovations and the biggest leaps in technology from your respective organizations over the last five or 10 years. Matt, can you serve us off? Yeah, of course. Um, so I guess it wouldn't be a mistake if I start out mentioning Boeing as, of having those technologies. But uh, I've, the biggest technology leap we've seen in, recently involving the P-8 in my own program was inline production. Uh, before 20 years, 25 years ago, uh, the tanker programs, the, the AWACS programs, you would see airlines being cur produced commercially, and then they transform them into military aircraft. Uh, Boeing, Boeing flipped that on its head, uh, and now produce aircraft inline production. So the aircraft is a military aircraft from the start, uh, from the P-8 side, and it's also being done on the tanker. And what you're seeing there is from inline production, much like the Model T way back in the day, uh, the efficiencies of the process improve it, and later on you're seeing efficiencies within 40% reduction in cost of the building those aircraft, which is saving the taxpayers and the government money, and you're going to see those same efficiencies within the tanker program. Uh, so that, that's one regard where you're seeing uh, technologies really improve uh, from a Boeing standpoint. The second piece I'd like to make, recommend is what I'm seeing now is uh, the collaboration between government and commercial entities, uh, which you didn't see five to ten years ago. Um, and these, these collaborations are proving much more uh, improved technology within the commercial and government sector, especially when you're talking about human and machine inter integration and artificial intelligence and creating uh, combat from the cloud type of environments. Uh, and you see that collaboration go on further between the Googles and the Microsofts. And most recently, Boeing signed a collaboration agreement with Microsoft to work together on these type of technologies. Great, thank you. Tenet Bergman, how about you? Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. And first and foremost, I'd just like to start out by saying that, especially within the United States Coast Guard, we've, over the past five to 10 years, we've become more reliant on technology to execute our missions of maritime safety, security, and stewardship, in addition to a protection of our ports, waterways, and coastal security. So that nexus kind of presents a new challenge for us, such as cybersecurity. So the technologies that, uh, that we have been evolving and basically catching up to match our industry partners with is basically the cyber industry innovate, innovations. And it's kind of combating a threat that you can't see. It's not a very tangible threat. So those uh, cyber warriors and innovations helping us to basically maintain the security of our maritime transportation system are the biggest technologies that we're working on, we're seeing that, that you know, challenge us today. Great. OK, so for the Navy, um, the thing that I've noticed the most um, are changes in our efficiency with, with the Navy. So um, things like energy conservation, we've really made leaps and bounds um, in the Navy with things like the Great Green Fleet and um, shipboard um, energy dashboards where you can see real time 
um, and see where your energy is being used and by what equipment. Um, we've also um, made huge advancements in our weaponry um, and also in like our ship, how our ships are structured, how they're built and designed just to make us a more efficient um, force. Great, thank you. One of the things that's always interesting is the development of technology within the military for military uses that have application outside the military, such as certain efficiencies. Uh, the internet, for example, developed by DARPA. Matt, did you have any other examples of technology that was uh, developed by for military programs or could be expanded out, outward? Uh, yeah, obviously you mentioned the internet, that's a big one, uh, invented by DARPA. Uh, obviously that people use today. And what you're going to see more forward today is uh, DARPA continues to evolve that technology within robotics uh, and, and for, through training services for virt virtual warfare uh, that DARPA's being, that, that's created most mostly on the commercial side that's being advanced for the military side as well. Another thing DARPA's working on is using uh, quantum navigation. Uh, using quantum navigation, measuring the Earth's uh, uh, magnetic fields, you can you use GPS positioning, uh, not by a satellite, but through the Earth's uh, magnetic fields. Uh, and through this technology, we'll no longer rely on satellites, uh, but for uh, the, those technologies to to determine your position. Obviously, this applies for the military use for missiles, uh, guidance systems, et cetera, for the aircraft, but also for the commercial side. From a cyber warfare, which the lieutenant mentioned, was not being able to be cyber hacked because you're no longer connecting to the satellites, but also from, uh, you, you don't have to be in a satellite area to, to maintain your position on your phone. Stuff like that. Great. I had the uh, great opportunity to visit beforehand, and we were talking about what's new and what's happening. Tell us about the Inside Passage. What's going on there? How is the sea ice melting? How is that affecting uh, what you're doing with the Coast Guard? So back when I was stationed on the Healy, I did several deployments up in the Arctic. And when you think of the Arctic, you think of this big white sheet of ice that covers the, the top of the earth. And it's really not like that. The weather patterns have a large effect on what the ice is doing and how it's moving. And actually on one of my deployments, we saw a 40-foot sailing vessel from Norway coming through and, and we hailed them on the radio asking them, do they need help? Do you need provisions? And they were completely okay and were happy to see us, you know, waved and, and went on their way. And you know, that really got us to thinking as our earth is changing, as our environment's changing, one of the things that we're definitely seeing is a need and going back to your question of kind of innovations in, in the military is kind of the need for more icebreaking capabilities as a Arctic nation. And as the inside passages opens up and, and our earth continues to evolve, what does that mean for the Coast Guard in the sense of our icebreaking fleet? We're also working on other craft in our fleet, but what does that mean for our icebreaking fleet? Recreation, that introduces search and rescue, which is another technological advancement that we rely heavily upon to execute our missions. So search and rescue, leisure, cruise ships, all those things, and e even commerce become huge considerations that we need to think about as a service. And another thing, I was communications officer on the vessel, and when we'd get to a certain point, we would lose satellite connectivity. So what does that mean for our ability to execute those missions that rely so much on the internet? So taking those things into consideration as we move forward as a nation, as we move forward as an organization to continue to execute those missions that I talked about in the beginning. Very exciting. Lieutenant Parks, what is the great green, green fleet? I take it that's a spin from the great white fleet. From it is. Um, uh, Secretary uh, Ray Mabus, when he uh, basically coined the term the great green fleet, that is in honor of uh, President Roosevelt's uh, great white fleet. But the Great Green Fleet um, is a carrier strike group um, led by the John C. Stennis, which is right over in Bremerton, but it's currently deployed um, in several other, other ships along with the Stennis. They use a uh, biofuel, um, and it's, it's composed of 10% beef fat, tallow, um, that they get from the Midwest. Farmers in the Midwest, they get this beef fat from. So 10% and then 10% petroleum, or nice, excuse me, 90% petroleum. And that's mixed together, and there's no, um, modification necessary for the engines. There's no modifications, no changes to the, the operating procedures for those engines. So it's a huge way that we are trying to, to learn how to conserve our fossil fuels and, and really make leaps and strides towards um, energy efficiency. Great, thank you. Um, one of the things we talked about too was production efficiencies. And Matt, I was wondering if you could share a little bit about the P8 production and how some of those efficiencies in just design. And the P8 is a maritime patrol aircraft based on a 737. 
Yeah, like you said, it's a, it's a 737 aircraft, uh, 800 wing, 900 fuselage, uh, designed off the 737 and, and built for anti-submarine warfare. And it's revolutionizing <clears throat> the way the U.S. Navy does anti-submarine warfare in the future. Not only because it was produced in line production, like I talked about earlier, but also because you're, you're, you're having the 99.8% commercial efficiency of the 737 aircraft transferred over to the military side. Uh, so you're seeing high efficiency rates for the aircraft being able to fly uh, all the time for the warfighter, which is a change of pace for when you're coming from the P-3, an, an old P-3 Orion, which is built during the 1970s. Uh, so, so having those efficiencies from the commercial world transfer over the defense side uh, has, has changed the way the Navy is doing anti-submarine warfare and conducting operations currently uh, in Kadena in, in the Pacific, Pacific Area operations. That's fantastic. And how about information warfare? You know, Seattle's known as the cloud city with um, with Microsoft and all the cloud, but information management, information warfare, but also, L Lieutenant Bergman, we were talking about information management with respect to search and rescue. That's critically important for the Coast Guard. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, yes, and actually it's kind of a unique topic that we're, we're talking about this right before you're getting to see a search and rescue demonstration, because one of the biggest pieces of technology that the Coast Guard utilizes uh, to benefit the public and to execute our job is what we call search and rescue operations. And it's a software system that we utilize to basically help us pinpoint almost down to uh, meters rescuing someone that's, that's critically about to start drowning. So the software system that which you will see demonstrated in a few minutes basically allows us to take information from many different sources whether it's human intelligence or even other technologies that we use, and put into one central software system, and it basically helps us put our assets right over top of a, a, someone that's, that could potentially lose their life. And you'll get to see what that looks like here in, in a few moments. Exciting. One of the, the neatest videos I've seen on YouTube lately is the railgun. How many people have seen the railgun videos? Okay. Lieutenant Parks, can you share us a little bit about what that is and what that means as far as technology? Certainly. So the railgun is one of the things that I think is the coolest thing that the Navy is working on uh, today. Um, and it uses electromagnetic uh, rails. It's, it basically looks like a railgun. It's got a barrel and a projectile. But instead of using explosives or uh, gunpowder, it uses uh, electromagnetic force to shoot this projectile. And it's, it's really interesting because if you think about the ships today uh, in the Navy, we have five inch guns on, on a, a vast majority of our ships. And the range, the approximate range for the projectiles from those five inch guns are about 15 miles. If you think about the World War II ships, the big 16 inch guns that they had, their range was about 24 miles. But with this rail gun and these projectiles that get shot out of the rail gun, uh, the range is now up to 125 miles. So it's just, yeah, it's really cool. It's such a cool piece of technology. And if you get a chance, look at the videos because this thing just is outstanding. It's, it's That's pretty great. Cool. And, you know, I, I used to fly off the aircraft carrier, and, and one of the new technologies now is replacing the steam catapults with electromagnetic catapults. So it's, it's just a great innovation with respect to uh, technologies that can be used universally. Um, okay, so what's around the corner? If we were to take a, uh, a telescope and look five years, ten years down the road, what do you think is going to be the biggest changes in the way we do business? Yeah, so I mean, I'd even put it down 20 years down the road even further is if you look at uh, from an airline standpoint of, of, of fuels and what fuels they use on, on airline, commercial airlines and, def and defense articles as well. Uh, we, Boeing's currently working on three different products. Uh, one product project is called Phantom Eye, uh, which uses uh, liquid nitrogen to fuel. Uh, it's actually a Ford Ranger engine uh, to fly long endurance uh, high altitude missions. Uh, propeller aircraft, a UAV, uh, unmanned air vehicle um, drone uh, for long distance. So that's one, so you're seeing a difference in fuel technology and no longer going away from uh, those type of uh, jet fuels that you see today. Uh, and the other two are called, um, I make sure I got this right, Sugar Volt and Sugar Freeze. Uh, I didn't invent the name. Um, but uh, Sugar Freeze actually uses uh, liquid hydrogen and uh, Sugar, Sugar Volt is an electronic propulsion. Uh, aircraft, uh, which you'll see Boeing's inventing to, to change the way uh, commercial aircraft are flown, uh, looking to about 20 30 time frame. So, no longer using uh, Jet A1 fuel, so, like for, so noise, uh, emissions, et cetera, uh, the, the way we're changing aircraft. And along with those aircrafts, we're redesigning the aircraft to be more fuel efficient. I think the biggest thing for the Coast Guard is, is twofold. One is reinvigoration of our fleet. Uh, we have um, 
plans to reinvigorate our off patrol, our excuse me, our offshore patrol cutters that should replace our patrol current patrol boats, and we have uh, fast response cutters as well. But additionally, like I was talking about, the icebreakers are another initiative to really invigorate our fleet and really put us back on the map as an Arctic nation. And, if, and another innovate, and another innovation, excuse me, is truly cybersecurity and basically becoming a leader in the maritime field and and in reinvigorating unity of effort to make sure that we're a leader in cybersecurity so we can protect our maritime transportation system. Terrific. And for the Navy, um, we are really striving to make uh, advancements in how efficient we are with our ships. So for example, our littoral combat uh, ships that we have, the Freedom and the Independence classes of ships, um, they are a lot more automated. They've you know made the crew size about 45. There's some challenges with the crew size and maintaining a rotating watch. Um, but that ship you, is driven by a joystick. And it's everything is, a lot of stuff is touch screen. It's, it's very, all the systems are integrated together through a computer system. And just making those technologies all talk together, all integrate together, and, and allowing um, the capability to basically do what our sailors do on an everyday basis. These computers are, are almost taking their jobs. So um, finding advancements in, in technology and how to make our lives easier um, as sailors is, is huge. And I think you said the normal crew component for a ship that size is 350? Just about, yes. On our destroyers, our, our so crew is about, about 20% of the crew members. That's impressive. Well, I think we have about five minutes for questions. Uh, is there anybody out there who has any questions for our panelists? We got one right in the back in the middle. Thank you. Regarding Coast Guard cutters, what I've read in the last year is that given what you said about the Northwest Passage and I think even the claims being made by Russia to resources in the North Pole, I understand that perhaps our ice breaking capacity may be two cutters in what I read, and it may not be true, but that the Russians may have in the double digits and are building eight or nine more. And I think even China is building cutters. Could you comment? Uh, yes, actually the Russians do have in the double digits of icebreakers and their icebreakers also nuclear powered, which presents an interesting challenge. And from my understanding, the Chinese have one, or they were in the, they were in the process of building one as well. So from our nation's standpoint, our service is basically, you know, advocating to Congress and and just putting forth that need and, and doing what we can with what we have to make sure that we're able to execute our missions. But we, we trust our leaders to make those decisions accordingly. We have a question over here. Eric Slaybaugh. So in both the public and the private sector, IT security is a significantly growing concern. Um, are there any significant innovations that you see on the forefront that might make the transition from DOD to the private sector? Yeah, I'll, I'll, from the civilian guy. Um, so right now, DARPA is actually doing its grand challenge here in the next couple of months, and DARPA is a defense aid research agency within the military, and they're doing their cyber challenge. And what their cyber challenge is, they're challenging uh, civilian companies to come up with solutions on how machines can automate it, fix themselves, uh, and adapt to the cyber challenge, right, the cyber threat. So if it senses a threat, it'll automatically defend itself and thwart off the threat without, without even the operator knowing. Uh, so that's part of the cyber challenge that they're doing. That's what you're going to see more of in the future is cyber is growing incredibly as the, the new evolving threat and evolving technologies uh, from the civilian world and the defense side and how the defense side will apply to the civilian world in the future because of what DARPA is doing on the defense side in terms of uh, the cyber challenge and other programs uh, such as AHARP, uh, another one that they're doing which is all about automated technology to to protect yourself uh, from a defense side and then obviously to the civilian side automatically and uh, using automation and, and artificial intelligence. It's when the machines become alive. Right. I think we have time for one, one more quick question. question. Jim Moore. 
We can do a lightning round if they're quick. Uh, very quickly, uh, we've seen how technology can rapidly, rapidly expand into the commercial sector, an example being drones. Um, but also, technology often brings with it a great deal of uh, additional complexity, too, which creates management problems. I think the mo world's most expensive ship, the Ford, the aircraft carrier, has gotten a lot of uh, bad publicity lately in terms of its uh, difficulty uh, becoming uh, combat ready. Uh, would you care to comment on how these two elements uh, perhaps affect the efficiency management that you seek? Certainly, yeah. So um, specifically for uh, ships, as, as we integrate new technologies onto the ships, um, we certainly do a lot of, of pre-testing, and, and then once it's integrated on the ship, um, we go through you know, certain sea trials um, with, with those technologies. And we, do, we really do, we run into snags with, with the new technologies that we, we get on board the ships, um, and we just kind of run them through the paces to, to find those inefficiencies and find where we can better it, and then go back to that company or that technology, whoever created that, and see how we can, can better fix it for our use. Um, and so we do um, pay attention to that, and, and we do work through the bumps that, and, and bruises that we get from new technology and, and using it on board. Terrific. One more round of applause for our panelists today. <laughs> Um, before President Kathy ends today's uh, meeting, to, um, we're going to experience a time-honored tradition every year that we do at Seafair. As you may know, one of the responsibilities of the Seafair King and Queen is to recognize the accomplishments of our community leaders with a royal knighting. So with that, I'll turn it over to the royal court and Richard to perform the ceremony. Oh, thank you again, and our king has arrived, ladies and gentlemen, former Seattle Seahawk, Jordan Babineau. And uh, much like Marshawn Lynch, he doesn't do interviews, just nightings. <laughs> All right, hold on. Where's my script? Oh, I shouldn't have said that while he's got that sword in hand. Uh, Jordan and I have had an absolute blast, and what a true honor this has been, and I can speak for you because you're not speaking. <laughs> no. Oh, can I please have President Kathy come forward for the royal knighting? All right. So come on over here, Kathy. Right? Woo! <laughs> and just down on, on a couple of knees. The look on Jordan's face right now. <laughs> Happy. All right. I, Queen Alcyone, as token of my great esteem for you and in recognition of your ability to honor this illustrious position, do hereby appoint you a Seafair Royal. Kathy Gibson, your Seattle for Rotary president, is a driven and accomplished woman with a professional focus on conflict resolution, business and management succe succession planning, and transition planning. She is a highly sought strategic consultant with a track record of helping organizations propel their success. She is very committed, a very committed volunteer to organizations that build communities locally, nationally, and internationally. And this is so cool. She is the only one, the, the, the only, the third American woman to have climbed Mount Everest. What? Are you ready for this, Jordan? Okay. President Kathy, I hereby declare you Supreme Duchess of Summit's Strategy and Seattle Four. Please, my dear, turn to the crowd a big wave with our King Jordan Babineau, introducing Supreme Duchess Kathy Gibson as she goes forth 
to spread the Seafair message with good cheer and community spirit throughout the Puget Sound. Congratulations. This is for you. Ooh. Well, now I have to behave. Okay. Well, thank you, King Neptune and Queen Halcyon, for being with us today. This is quite an honor. I also want to thank all the Sea Services personnel who joined us today. This is a special annual event, and it's exciting to have you here in our midst. So, my thanks on behalf of our whole club for all of you who joined us today. <laughs> And I want to give a thanks again to our Rotary Seafair program planning team. If you'll stand, Beth Knox, Ian Hudson, Tom Jaffa, thank you so much. So today, especially standing up here looking out, I note the uniforms of the armed services personnel and even the royal regalia of our Seafair royalty. While we Rotarians don't have a formal uniform, we do have one wearable, which distinguishes us and unites us with 1.2 million Rotarians around the world, and that's our rotary pin. So my call to action this week is to wear our rotary pins for the month of August. Not just to rotary meetings, but everywhere you go. Let the world know we are proud Rotarians and we stand for an organization that represents good in the world. So let's proudly display our wearable, our rotary pin in the month ahead. Speaking of looking ahead, we've got a search and rescue demo that's gonna be right outside on the balcony. We have an opportunity to gather for some fellowship tomorrow night. Both uh, Rotarians and guests alike are welcome to join us at Elephant and Castle starting at 5 o'clock. And then I hope you'll join us for our next meeting. It's next Wednesday at the Westin. We're going to tackle the topic of gender identity and transgender issues from all perspectives. So that's what's up ahead. Enjoy Seafair Week and thank you everyone. We'll see you at the Westin. <laughs> You'll notice that SpongeBob is wearing a personal flotation device or a life jacket so that he won't have any trouble staying afloat. If your head is underwater, you will suck in water into your lungs. If you don't have a life jacket or PFD on, you'll sink. Your life jacket keeps you on the surface of the water so you can be pulled from the water and resuscitate it. It helps you conserve energy and extend your survivability in a water survival situation.